Hey there, folks. It's 5.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February the 3rd. You know what's coming next. 2,022 years from something. Today, I'm going to go over uh, two main things. A couple of things first. And these things are going to be um, sort of follow-ups from yesterday. Okay? Because these topics are huge. So, look, uh, I do want to let everybody know there's been a lot of people that followed that series, Let's Consider Luke. I'm still working on the last few episodes. There's just a lot to cover in those last few episodes because we're right at the point in Luke where um, we're what they call the passion. Okay, so it's it's the... The Last Supper, Trial, um, right now the chapter I'm in is the what's called the Olivet Discourse. So it's bulky. I mean, when you get to the end there, that's a huge amount of material. Um, and, oh, you, today's hat is, is for my son, actually. I was on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's really into Thomas. And trains. I like trains too. I, I love trains. I've ridden on steam trains. Um, I love steam power. I think steam power is absolutely fantastic. You generate so much power just from steam. And I mean, when you consider it, you know, most of the turbines that create our energy today are still, um, they run on steam, steam power. And, you know, you can use various fuels to um, eh, fuel it. But yeah, anyways, so there's near where I used to live, there was a very cool steam museum. It was an outdoor steam museum. And they had, um, they had different size steam locomotives. And then they had one like little gas engine that was just for kids. Super cool, though. It was all... And... Um, they did have various other steam uh, engines to run different things, just steam motors and engines. Uh, they had a sawmill that was powered by steam and so on and so forth. Steam power, water power, I love water power, and the use of wheels to, to power things. Um, anyways, so that's the hat. And I haven't done the, um, I, I haven't done the, the country you know, bend yet on this. I'm just, I'm kind of leaving it for now. Not trying to be ghetto, just not, not doing the, you know, the country bend. Yet. So yeah, the last few episodes of Let's Consider Luke are coming and um, more of the Obrey Hours is coming too. I had to um, have my one friend who has helped develop a lot of the, uh, the uh, documents uh, help me develop a new type of document for word testing because there's something that I'm looking at in particular that's another one of those big ones. So that's coming too. And um, that's about it. Sorry. <laughs> Lost train of thought. So I do want to start by addressing uh, something I mentioned yesterday. Um, a channel I highlighted in context of a limited hangout. Now, what happens is a lot of people send me a lot of things, and I, I do try to look at everything. If you send me things and they're condensed, it helps, but it doesn't always have to be. I mean, if it's a long article... Or if it's a channel with a lot of content, it just might take longer to get to. It's understandable. But I do get sent a lot of channels. And so in the course of just trying to get a feel for what various channels do, um, well, sometimes I get them mixed up. So the Stolen History Channel is not uh, the same channel that I was thinking of. Um, this other channel, and I've looked through my favorites, 
and I, I've got a feeling that I just deleted that other channel because I have so many that you keep adding and it just becomes impossible to find anything. I'm pretty sure I deleted them. And so I, I'm sure I mistaked stolen history. Now here's the mistake. This is, I'm not saying that I agree with everything on the stolen history channel because I, I have watched a bit. Um, and I would say that I, I do think some of the assertions on there are based on information that has been released to the public, has kind of gotten out there, that is actually limited hangout information. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that. We are as hard as, as some people search we're still pretty much stuck with the information we're stuck with. I address this in bringing it all together, like right at the start. For somebody who is uh, diligently looks, they do hit a brick wall. They, they only get so far, so much information. And that's, it's not fine in the sense of, of general, that's fine. But that is our limitations for now until we get into the real libraries. So, although I, I do think there's some information I disagree with from what I've watched so far, because I watched some of it this morning to make sure, and um, I was called um, by somebody involved with it yesterday who explained to me that, for one thing, it's not an operation with a few mysterious figures, you know, claiming um, maybe things that aren't true. So, I'm not saying I'm going to agree with everything I look through on this channel, but I'm not saying I'm going to disagree with it. And the biggest problem I have is this. It's not that other researchers are presenting information that is incomplete or sometimes even inaccurate. That's gonna happen based on our limited available resources. It just is. My problem is when names are put on things. Now, a, a few people already commented um, concerning, for instance, the term Tataria. Now, when I did um, when I did the interview with um, that young man on Radio Tartary, now I can't remember his name. Anyways, one of the first things I did, because that was one of the main things that he would typically talk about, is I tried to clarify. And I said, well, I just want to make absolutely sure, since this isn't my specialty, I just want to make sure. Is the, the idea or the name Tartary or Tataria, I said, is that just a blanket term, or are we talking about something that we can really nail down as a, you know, a real place, real kingdom that we can absolutely say absolutes about and draw absolute conclusions from what we absolutely know about it. And he did agree that it was more of a generalization, which is what I thought it was. But the problem is, and that's fine, the problem is um, when that generalization starts becoming a, a very concrete thing based on very non-concrete evidence, as in, when you start using a name, and I've talked about this with terminology, you start using a name, you start putting a name on something that may not be entirely accurate. Whether you mean to or not, whether you're doing it maliciously or you're not doing it maliciously, you are contributing to potential misunderstanding about something. This morning, I'm going through documents. I have to do a lot of really boring, tedious stuff. 
And whenever I can, I listen to something in the background. One of the things, and I wasn't listening to the Stolen History Channel in the background because I want to watch too, because they put a lot of effort into the video part. And same thing with bringing it all together. Y you really have to watch it at least once. Listen to it a number of times, that's fine, but you should watch it at least once. So I was listening to Autodidactic. Um, and he was talking about the White House and the rebuild of the White House in the 1950s. And he's talking about the foundation because they had dug down into the foundation. And when he's describing what he's seeing in the pictures, and this is another problem I have, and most people are doing it. He says, well, what we see down here in the foundation, we see this sunken signs of mud flood. Mud flood. And there are a lot of reasons why a building can be sunk. The jail that I, I did most of my time in jail years ago at one particular jail more than any. It was Porter County Jail in the state of Indiana. Porter County Jail's old jail building used to be catty corner from the old courthouse, which is um, a beautiful old stone courthouse. Um, it's fantastic. I'm sure there's other channels that have probably done a lot on courthouses because some of these courthouses, just county courthouses, beautiful buildings. Anyways, it was it was Caddy Corner. Um, you, I mean, you could easily see, not just see. It was literally there. You had one block, you know, and the street ran down. Then it was like basically about a a block maybe in between, and then you had this building that that was the old jail building. It was a newer it was a newer building, sort of. And what they had was they had a tunnel uh, underneath that that went to the courthouse. And you could just, you didn't have to load prisoners in vans or anything like that. You could just walk them straight over there and, and do their appearances and then back. And then they built the new one, the new jail, because they wanted to pack a whole hell of a lot more people in there. So they needed a bigger facility. And... For whatever reason, the county decided to buy this land uh, right next to the main north and south road that runs through Porter County. It's uh, State Road 49. And they put this jail in there on swampland. It was on wetland. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because most places actually have laws against building on wetlands. <laughs> But they can do whatever they want. They're the government. They're the government. So they, they put it on this um this wetland. And I don't know all the story. You, know, you hear rumors. But I was in it. And I saw what happened. Just in a few short years. Obviously they did not. Um, they did not put this on good solid uh, piles. Down into the bedrock. Uh, to really. Um support the foundation properly. I would imagine that's what it was because that would have been a lot of expense for them. And, you know, they're going to build this gigantic facility and it was the jail and it was the sheriff's office. So all the county brownies, that was their hangout and it was 911. I mean, it, all of these things there. So kind of important, but it looks like they cut a lot of corners. Somebody probably made a lot of money um, slicing off the top on that one. And one side, the whole time I stayed there, which was uh, off and on over a few years, uh, mostly on during those years, the whole wing, there was uh, four wings like diamond shaped, okay? You had the, the main wing, main control, and the offices and the sheriff's department, all that, okay? It was a uh, main control area, okay? And then you would go straight straight forward from that all the way to um uh, I'm sorry you would go right straight to C <laughs> and then you had A this way you had B this way 
and then you had kitchen and other facilities were another part of it. But it was basically diamond shaped, okay? This, um, the B wing was sunk. Now, it hadn't sunk a lot, but the thing is, and especially a building that size, and there are levels, there are pods there that are two level pods. They have a lower and upper floor. Had sunk enough to where there were large cracks running through various walls. These steel doors that they use in more modern jails, they wouldn't close. And those, those steel doors have to be able to close well, very correctly, be, because of just security issues. They can't not be closing very well. That would not be good. A lot of bad things could happen. They have to be able to close very well and latch very well, and most of them did not. There were even ones that would catch on the steel. Um, really, it would would be... No, there were some that would catch literally on the steel frame. I was going to say the stop, which it should. There were ones that would actually catch on the steel frame. That's how out they were. And then there were others that wouldn't even fully latch because they were so far out to where they were even out past the steel stop, the door stop. It was pretty bad. There's a lot of reasons a building can sink. And sometimes it's just greed and stupidity. That greed and stupidity is not a new thing. Sure, there was lots of it centuries ago, millennia ago. Um, and then, of course, there's always erosion. Erosion's not a mud flood. Erosion is lack of maintenance over a long period of time. And there can be, uh, let's say, changes in the uh, geogra uh, geology, geography, topography of a land, maybe even in proximity to a place where somebody wants to assume a mud flood occurred. And what this can cause is various kinds of erosion, even if a place sinks down, and it can. Not the building, but literally the area where the building is. That can happen. Again, lack of maintenance. It's You'd be surprised, and some wouldn't, but when you don't maintain a structure, um, a landscape, a lot of things, how fast it can accumulate debris f from uh, just all kinds of, of different things that happen, just weather, natural things, animals are going to come in, other things are going to inhabit. There's so many reasons. And you know, um, Static in the Attic, he did a video because he questions this sort of unified narrative that's pushed to. He obviously doesn't agree with a lot of things that, that I think or my opinions and vice versa, but I want to give credit, always I want to give credit where credit is due. He has voraciously questioned uh, why is this certain narrative pushed all the time? And he did a video um, showing uh, the foundations below ground level of a certain church and showing information that actually these were crypts and these crypts were oftentimes sold for burial under this place. And there was a reason that certain things were buried in certain ways. So when we look at Things like people will look at windows that are sort of half buried and they'll say that's a problem for a number of reasons, yet they don't absolutely know in most cases. And by the way, I don't know if a lot of them have seen a lot of various structures that are new built where people put full size windows below ground level simply as an egress and they put a large box around it with retainers that's not weird or uncommon no full-size double hung windows below ground level 
full-size doors below ground level and they simply have stairways leading out of them. Maybe those aren't there anymore. There can be a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons why windows and do doors could be below a certain level of foundation. There's so many reasons, but for somebody like, for instance, autodidactic in that video, when he's looking at the White House foundations to just throw in that term mud flood. When you keep throwing in terms like mud flood, reset, um, you know, I hear things like uh, collective memory loss instead of what is really, I would say, this is my opinion, I know, it's more likely the case is that we're looking at a, uh, a very thought out, well thought out, concerted effort to, to de-educate and reprogram people to start all over again that we see it all at the same time as far as what literature and learning uh, knowledge is coming in at what given time plus um, this phenomenon of what's called orphan trains. And that whole phenomenon, there was a lot of that, a lot of children being separated from their parents, their parents remembering, the children not remembering. If you do that enough in succession, if you need to do it in succession, you can get the world to where they don't remember anymore. And some cultures and some peoples have a better memory than others. Some cultures and some people are actually far easier to do that to than others. It's part of ethnology. It's part of recognizing race and differences in peoples and tribes and so on. So, you know, to just keep hammering in this sort of narrative like it had to be this way, that's completely bogus. If you're doing it sincerely, you're totally out of line. You know, and of course, if you're doing it because you're getting a paycheck to do it, well, there's nothing I can say that doesn't involve just coarse language, so... You suck. All right. So what I've done, I've actually collected, just this morning, some photographs. Because it's one thing for me to, to tell you, uh, hey, this is this. But it, it's a far different thing for me to show you. Um, now, in my last video, I told you I wasn't using the, the J word anymore unless we were talking about sort of, um, and I called it a religion, but basically we're, we're talking about people that will adhere to a certain t type of, of social philosoph uh, philosophical with religious overtones ideas as are found in the Talmud and the Zohar and various uh, rabbinic writings okay that's really the only context that the j word makes any sense in and then to me of course it still doesn't make sense because then it's called a religion and uh religions are nonsense religions are nonsense in 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 the way that we've been taught that a people is unified through their religious beliefs, through a, uh, a particular spiritual thing, they then become unified, uh, even though we don't ever see that consistently uh, playing out in reality. And, um, and religions are also used to control people, very effectively used to control people. Uh, now, that varies sharply from the Law and the Prophets, which the Law and the Prophets, well, let's say the Law, which was given to Adam kind and then repeated as part of the covenant for blessing and remaining in the land of Canaan, in that area. That was all for proper treatment of one another, order, um, a growing of the people, a prospering of the people, and reflecting uh, the goodness and often patience of Yahweh, the one who gave it. 
Oftentimes you'll see points in that law which are specific to people and the, the tendencies people have as far as our behavior. But most of that having specifically to do with what is simply good and moral and what is going to be the best, most responsible, good and moral way to act towards one another of your own uh, nation, tribe, people, and others that are not part of your nation, tribe, or people. It's not the same as religion. It's a law. Which encompasses, first off, far more, and it's far less... Um, speculative and touchy-feely, you know, based on emotion. So let's go over these photos real quick. I'm going to put them as big as I can on the screen so anybody can take uh, a quick look if they're not watching this and see the point that I am illustrating. So here, I'm going to start by bringing up some Ashkenazim, uh, photos of Ashkenazim that we have on screen. This first one is Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan is an obvious Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim and really any specific tribe of people. This is why ethnologists can actually group people based on features. Um, it's, of course, harder and harder today to do so simply because Certain peoples, more than others, but a lot of people, have done a whole heck of a lot of mixing. A whole lot of mixing. And sometimes in more in certain areas than others. And I believe that's for uh, a purpose that it has been promoted to, for one thing, to hide the sharp distinction between people types. But the Ashkenazim does have certain physical markers. They do vary, as with anyone. Any tribe of people that are going to have physical markers that vary. The Israelites would have physical markers that vary. And that would be in hair color, eye color, um, certain bone structure features. Okay? Why? Well, for one thing, Jacob had his 12 sons with four different women, two of which were sisters, and we don't know if those two had the same mother or not. The other two were not sisters. Uh, they were the handmaids of the two sisters. Now, we have no reason to believe that those two handmaids were of another race, per se, because that sort of thing was absolutely forbidden in the law. And we have no reason to believe that Yahweh would begin a nation of very particular people with a mixed group of people that had gotten that way through lawless behavior. It really doesn't make sense. But there would be variation. There is variation in any tribe or group. You're going to see it. I mean, some of the things, though, that you would look for with an Ashkenazim is sometimes um, a very long nose, longer uh, above the brow, you know, uh, protruding closer to the lip. Um, oftentimes a, a flat, high upper lip, oftentimes a, a heavy uh, bottom lip. These aren't criticisms. These are simply observations of features. You can sometimes see it in, in the brow, the, the head shape, back of the skull shape. There's differences, and so on and so forth. There are markers. There are markers that vary. Some of the people who identify as Ashkenazim or who identify as anything else, um, they are actually mixed in ways that they don't really tell anyone. And so sometimes certain features would not be as apparent or would be softer. I suppose you could use, you know, that word, uh, uh, whatever that means. But um, because that word even is a, a subjective word. So again, Barbara Streisand, she has certain features. Sometimes uh, some will notice that the, the eyes uh, have a certain slant or sometimes oriental look uh, to the Ashkenazim, depending, again, variations. Again, we see the more protruding lower lip. We see the sort of flatter 
uh, upper lip. That's the only way I can describe it. I'm sorry if there's a better description for it. We see the more elongated nose. Um, again, not criticisms. Um, I know some people describe their features in a critical way. I'm not trying to be critical at all, really. I'm just trying to be objective and point these things out to you. Okay. I personally, I don't have criticisms of their features in general. A long time ago, um, before I even started researching any of these things, I dated at least one Jewish girl that, that I knew and, and she knew was Jewish. She, she did have distinctly Jewish features. She was an attractive girl. So I'm not pointing any of these things out to, you know, criticize. They, they're just features. This is Nathaniel Kapner, brother Nathaniel Kapner. Again, clear features, uh, the sort of elongated nose, what some would say it, they would call hook nose. <laughs> that may not always be the best term because there are other people uh, of uh, very different genetic types that also have what some might call a hook nose. They might mistake hook nose for beak nose, but there is a certain um, more particular curl or just, let's say, shape. It's an identifiable shape in the nose. Kapner looks like he has the more heavier lower lip, but since he has um, so much beard, there are some things that are hard to define. There are some of them with blue eyes, some of them with hazel eyes. Whether that is a, a natural feature or whether that is uh, part of some mixing, I don't know. Anyways, um, so that was Nathaniel Kapner and Let's take a look at, uh, I'm going to save one of those for later, Larry King. Again, we have very particular features. These are <clears throat> sort of unmistakable. These are Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim, not the J word. Lose the J word. These are Ashkenazim. Okay, let's see what, uh, what else I got. Oh, yeah. Sarah Silverman. Very distinctly Ashkenazim. Not an ugly person on the outside. <laughs> Anyways. All right. So that gives you, I, I think, a pretty good feel for what we're looking at as far as Ashkenazim. Now, I am going to show you a number of pictures of people who absolutely do and their families absolutely have for as, as long as we know identified as the J. These people are absolutely not in any way, shape or form <laughs> Ashkenazim. Okay, some of them I sort of can identify to you what they most likely are, but I'm still not getting into the um, specific science of surnames yet. This is Alex Jones. Alex Jones has admitted to, and I'm not saying he always tells the truth, but he has admitted. Alex Jones has says he he has sorry has said, I am a Jew. He's married to one. I don't know um, what particular tribe she is, if she's Ashkenazim or whatever else, just identifying, okay? There are a number of people that identify clearly as Jew that simply do not have the genetic markers that the Ashkenazim does. Um, now I'm going to just flip through, and if I get to an Ashkenazim again, I might just pass it up. This is Alicia Silverstone. Not an Ashkenazim. Jew, yes. That's what she calls herself. Clearly, she is not Ashkenazim. We have Benjamin Disraeli. Now, it's easy to look at pictures of him when he was quite old because the only actual photos that exist of him that I'm aware of are when he was quite old. Now, it's easy when someone gets old 
to start poking around guessing that they are a certain thing because when especially men some women especially men get old um men's brows will often change their appearance a bit their nose will change its appearance uh, oftentimes there's a certain amount of weight i guess you could say a uh, very small amount but yeah a certain amount of weight or girth that a man gains in his nose as he ages same thing with the ears and other features it's not like when you were young and you looked much different when you were young when you age certain features get heavier they tend to distort um so sometimes it's not entirely fair to look at pictures of people when they were old you also want to look at them when they were young and i might have another example of what i'm talking about in here but this is a a, a painting of disraeli when he was young clearly not Ashkenazim and Disraeli because of the time that he lived in or well let's just say the time that he was the prime minister of uh, England in the so 1860s to 70s um, it was known and he claimed the Sephardic title clearly not Ashkenazim and now we have um, uh, <laughs> Kudenhof, sorry, it's quite a name. Sorry, Kudenhof Clergy. Kudenhof Clergy is uh, was admittedly half uh, Japanese and half what Jewish. Now you can see the Japanese, the Oriental features in Kudenhof Clergy. You what you cannot see in Kudenhof Clergy is Ashkenazim features, genetic markers. Can't see it. It's not there because he isn't. He is a different kind, race, type, whatever you want to call it, genus, specimen. He's, he's clearly different. Clearly different. And we have to, the more we understand uh, the nature of our world and the life forms on our world, whether they be um, animal, including us, or a plant. If you leave these things alone, plants, people, if you leave them alone, they all have a tendency. Even if you crossbreed them, you take a, a type of animal, and a lot of farmers, let's say this is a big thing which I'm very against. A lot of farmers, dairy farmers, crossbreed cows in order to produce more milk or let's say like over in um, the occupied territories Palestine they have a certain breed there that can handle the heat better and they specially bred for that I'm absolutely against that you put cows out to pasture and let them to themselves let the um, you know the bulls mingle with the cows and you're probably gonna have a problem you put a couple of different kinds of bulls together I promise you but for a good reason but anyways if if you left them to themselves any any sort of animal they're going to have a tendency to breed themselves back into what they were from the start it may take a long time sometimes but that's the tendency that everything natural what they would call heritage breeds whether in plants or animals animals including us I'm just saying I'm not calling us animals but you get the point we're going to tend to go back to what it was that we were created as in the first place it's, it's a natural thing what we've become what a lot of people are today is is really more engineering than anything else this picture on the screen is Dominic Guzman. Now, I'm not saying that is, I'm saying that is a painting. Dominic Guzman. Dominic Guzman is known as the founder of the Dominicans. Um, essentially an order of monks involved with the Catholic Church that had a, quite a lot of 
uh, to do with the um, uh, various inquisitions. They were known to be pretty brutal. Um, in fact, you know that the head of the Spanish Inquisition, uh, Torquemada, Sephardic, not Ashkenazim, the, the guy who was known as such a, a horrific, sadistic brute, Sephardim. Dominic Guzman, Sephardim. And I can prove it to you. I'm not going to bring it up right now, but you can do it. You can go to Sephardim.com. It's maybe Sephardim.co, okay? And you can click on the G, go right to the very end of the page, and you will see Guzman. Dominic Guzman. And it's now becoming more and more admitted that Guzman and the um, Dominicans were started by Moranos, sometimes we'll call them Moranos conversos, crypto Jews, Sephardim. Okay? So you look at that face, that is not. Ashkenazim. The features of many of these guys' face is it, it actually shares more ethnic markers with with my face, with the face of of uh, any other German, Celt, Anglo, Western European, Dutch, you name it. Which were I'm talking about all varieties of a people. Than they do with Ashkenazim. They're closer to us in, in um, ethnological markers. These are not the same people. The problem is when people think of some of the most, you know, brutal, you know, rough things that have happened in the past, again, what they're going to contrive in their mind, the picture they're going to get in their mind is the Ashkenazim instead of the, the actual people, historically, which don't look anything like the Ashkenazim, which um, I would suggest to you, they have used the Ashkenazim to accomplish uh, many of their goals in a lot of various countries. That doesn't clear the Ashkenazim of anything that they've done, but it, if we're clarifying who's done what at what time and, and so on and so forth, there are a lot of people that are guilty of a lot of things. My own people, Germans and Celts, I would say this. We are, we are absolutely guilty of um, being so complacent and so self-serving, uh, absolutely pathetic, and so willing to worship others, which was exactly our condition uh, described over and over as a great criticism by Yahweh in the prophets is that, uh, and oftentimes it's translated as whoring ourselves after other people, their cultures, their ways, their looks. I don't even think the Israelites were the best looking of all quote unquote white people. I think we were very average people. Like, I don't think, you know, we're all ugly or anything, but we were average. We weren't, we weren't necessarily the best at this or the best at that or whatever. Why would we be? Why would Yahweh, if he wanted to show his greatness and his glory to the world, why would he pick the tribe of people within this, uh, this Adamic line in general? Why would he pick the tribe of people that were the best at this and that, the best looking and so on and so forth? Why wouldn't he pick a people that was quite common amongst all the other people? I actually believe the, the Mitzri were probably uh, a more advanced and probably a better looking people, as were the Ashuri, Assyrians. These, some of these people, I believe, are still around today. They're just known by other names. I don't think we were necessarily the smartest or anything else. What we were that made us very unique and made us oftentimes a severe problem for other nations that wished to dominate us and forcibly take our labor through whatever means, is that especially when we were obedient in that covenant with Yahweh, we became a terrible problem for these people. That's why they've worked very hard to keep us outside of that covenant. 
their seminaries teach almost nothing but grace and no law because that keeps us outside of the covenant. If we are lawless, we are promised all the curses from Deuteronomy 28. If we are lawful, the blessings. That really matters if you're a people that is trying to control the world and you don't want competition. So this is also Dominic Guzman. You tell me that's a Sephardic face. Now that's an, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> that's an older statue of him. I believe that is in the Vatican. I may be wrong. Um, and I want to get, I'm, I'm going to come back to those pictures I just went past real quick, okay? Um, this right here is Henry Morgenthau, not Ashkenazim. He looks, honestly, Henry Morgenthau looks more like the older Dutch people that I live around than anything else. This right here, this pasty, pasty man with the big rosy cheeks, that's Heim Solomon known as one of the chief financers of the American Revolution. Now, there are pseudo Heim Solomon pictures out there. Now, this right here, that statue, that's a statue of Heim Solomon. Okay, it's at least attributed to Heim Solomon. This is sort of older without the wig on, few pounds on. That's your average white guy today, right? That's not an Ashkenazim. And this is, uh, I named this pseudo Heim Solomon because this sketch, I believe, um, was actually the inorganic picture. Sometimes there are these um, random pictures out there trying to make some of these people who were clearly Sephardim, who, who shared uh, no ethnological traits, markers, features with the Ashkenazim. Oftentimes, these pictures start circulating that make them look more Ashkenazim, like this one does. But the vast majority of photos painting statues, statues of Chaim Solomon, um, he absolutely looks nothing of the sort. Okay. Ah, right here, Ignatius Loyola. I know these pictures are small, but I can't keep them, I can't keep them big as I scroll. You know, I'll, I'll bring it up on the screen. Ignatius Loyola. L L L he was a Murano. He was Sephardic. He was from a, um, a family that were part of, uh, the, what they call Alumbrado, which fraternal, fraternal societies had nothing to do with religion, fraternity. This is the problem with doing this. Once I, I blow up these, then I can't scroll through them as easily. My scroll doesn't work. Let me see. So now I'm going to have to go back in here and select again. This is why I'm not blowing all of these things up as I go. Okay, just giving you a reason. And here's another picture. This is one of the oldest pictures used, like traditional pictures of Ignatius Loyola. Um, his original name was um, said to be Yanigo Lopez. Right. You might find a number of Sephardics with the name Lopez that look Latino, Hispanic. You will notice that there are a lot of Latinos named Lopez because these people, just as described um, by the, Canaan, uh, the Canaanites were doing when Joshua and Israel came into Canaan, they were breeding outside of their race and their kind, which was a huge offense to Yahweh, and that's what these people do. That's why you have so many people that they can point to and say this is Sephardim, because they have bred so much, so many different varieties outside of their own kind. Okay, you look at this statue of Ignatius Loyola, all right, that's Whitey right there. Okay, same with this old picture, Whitey. Now, this is something quite newer, which tries to make him look far more Ashkenazim because there is much profit for the Sephardim to make 
everyone think that a J-E-W is specifically the Ashkenazim. So that the Sephardim become absolutely invisible. Now here we have the probably one of the greatest uh, referenced rabbis of Judaism. Moses Maimonides. It's a statue of him. It's a pretty well-known statue of this guy, right? Take a look at his features. They're the features, what do you want me to say, of a white man. They're not, let's just say, these are not Ashkenazim features. This is a picture of him created later, trying to make him look far more Eastern, quasi-Oriental, and definitely way different than that statue. This, this is a portrait of a young, because we want to try to show them when they're kind of young, young men, if we can. If I, you know what, if I could find some pictures of when I was young, quite young, in my 20s, maybe early 30s, you would see, I mean, there's, there's such a difference. And in, in a sense, I, I almost think that in our 20s and 30s, it sort of shows maybe the clearest what our genetic markers are without the influence of age, hardship, um, sickness and disease, uh, damage, can change even your face, those things. Those are, you know, external things. This is Manasseh ben Israel. He was probably the, the most powerful rabbi in Holland at the time. This is mid-16th century. And I know we get, we get really shaky as we go back, but this is what has stayed with us. These paintings, these statues, so on and so forth. So somebody at some point in time before the Ashkenazim were the picture, those genetic features were the picture people got in their mind, there were people who said, yeah, this is the J.E.W. Manasseh ben Israel. And look at Manasseh ben Israel. I, I went to school. I grew up with guys in my small little farm town in Indiana. Looked like Manasseh ben Israel. He's a white guy. Sabbatai Tsevi. Sabbatai Tsevi. Very few images that I'm aware of of Sabbatai Tsevi. Uh, a lot of them far more recent. Again, changing his features. This is from a pretty old uh, woodcut of him. Again, I've known guys, I grew up with guys who had very similar features to this in my small little Indiana town. Sabbatai Tzvi. He's, I mean, you know, he is credited as the father of Sabbateanism, and there's a lot uh, uh, concerning Sabbatai Tzvi. It's hard to get good information on Sabbatai Tzvi and Jacob Frank and the what they call the Sabbatean Frankists and that whole movement. And uh, then that leads into like the Don May and um, that. So, not Ashkenazim. Okay. Now, those are. Uh, all the pictures for this. I'm I'm nearly at an hour. Um, you know that's just how it has to go. Now I had a number of of celebrity photos too that I'm actually going to. You know I thought when I scrolled through these that they weren't going to save like that. Real fast, guys. And I know this is small on my screen, but at least you'll know who these people are. I'm going through real fast. We're going to start at the top. Natalie Portman does not look Ashkenazim. Scarlett Johansson. Now, this is a list of celebrities who are Jewish. They absolutely claim Jewish ancestry, and you follow their families back, uh, either on both sides or whichever side, and you're going to find the same thing. Um, Scarlett Johansson doesn't look Ashkenazim. Harrison Ford, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't look Ashkenazim. Daniel Day-Lewis does not look Ashkenazim. Dustin Hoffman absolutely does. Steven Spielberg does. Bob Dylan does. Joseph Gordon-Levitt does not. James Franco does not. Jonah Hill 
does look Ashkenazim. Seth Rogen does look Ashkenazim. Mila Kunis does not. Paul Newman does not. Woody Allen does. Jack Black does. Daniel Radcliffe does. Jake Gyllenhaal and Maggie Gyllenhaal do not. Eva Green does not. Amy Winehouse does. Adam Sandler does. Ben Stiller does. Robert Downey Jr. does not. Look at the younger. But even you can see it today, okay? He does not. Gwyneth Paltrow does not. Sean Penn does not. Shea LaBeouf, not really. Adrian Brody, absolutely yes. David Duchovny, no. Sasha Baron Cohen, absolutely yes. Jay Barukel, I don't know. Jerry Seinfeld, yes. Andy Samberg, yes. Uh, Akiva Schaefer, yes. Jason Siegel, not so much. Jude Apatow, yes. Josh Radner, yeah. Jason Alexander, oh yeah. Julia Lewis Dreyfus, mm, kind of, yeah. Kind of, but not. Maybe mixed. Uh, David Schwimmer, uh, yeah. Um, Richard Dreyfus, mm, mm. Maybe a little closer to uh, Tzavitai Zvi, but not particularly Ashkenazim, but you know, eh, some variations there. Matthew Broderick, no. Peter Sellers, no. I would say no. And there is some argument on some of these guys. You know that. Peter Sellers, some people might argue, well, he's this and he's got that. And I'm, I don't think so. Not quite. Larry David, yes. Leonard Cohen, yes. Stanley Kubrick, mm, I don't know. I don't think so. Now, Albert Einstein's a funny duck. You look at young pictures of him, and you're like, well, I mean, you know, ooh. What is he? Young pictures. Again, you start looking at old pictures of people, and it's just so easy to say, oh, look at that big nose. Oh, look at those morose features as if, you know, again, and then it becomes a polemic and it becomes a criticism as opposed to us just looking at features and trying to figure this out based on the genetic markers, not as a criticism. Allen Ginsberg, yes. Harvey Keitel, no. Andrew Garfield, yes. Winona Ryder, no. Sarah Silverman, yes. Paul Simon, yes. Art Garfunkel, yes. Joaquin Phoenix, yes. River Phoenix, no. <laughs> Because their mom looked so different than their dad. Yaquin looks just like their dad. River Phoenix looked just like their mom. It's ridiculous how that happened. But then you've got an example of mix. Now, it, if they didn't look so clearly like one parent or the other, and they were mixed, then I would probably look and say, that's hard to say. Maybe. Maybe that feature or, you know, but we got lucky on these two, and they look so clearly like one parent or the other. Helena Bonham Carter, I'm going to have to say, yeah. But I could be wrong, to be honest with you. You know what? It's probably because of her sort of pointy nose and stuff. But pointy nose doesn't equal Ashkenazim. So maybe Helena Bonham Carter, because the Carters are actually a... They come from, I believe an older people that are not Ashkenazim. So I could be wrong about Helena Bonham Carter. Maybe not. Mel Brooks. I know everybody's going to say, yeah. Maybe. Stan Lee. No, I don't think so. Drake. <laughs> Mix. Lou Reed. Mm -mm. Really, you see him when he's young? No, he doesn't. He doesn't look like me. He may not look like a number of Western Europeans, but I don't think he looks Ashkenazim either. There's a lot of different kinds of people out there, you know. Eli Wallach, not necessarily. Zach Ephraim, not ne no. I would say no. Dave Franco, again, no. Another Franco, yeah, another Franco. By the way, guys, can I point this out? The insane, insane hypocrisy of this. Look at there's a guy out there named Brandon Martinez who pushes white, 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 white. Words damage if they're deceptive, okay? You need to talk about tribes. Stop talking about white. I don't use... I use that word when I have to, when it's a generalization. That's all it is. You start preaching this thing like whites are a unified people, then you're just falling into the hands of the people that are deceiving you. Because when you start using white, 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 then the Sephardim absolutely disappear. 
the Ashkenazim don't. And now they are what everybody's going to look at as the problem. And they are simply a tool just like other people's are that are used to um, disrupt other people's. Now, it would be, I think it would be very good if we stopped allowing this sort of thing to happen because I'm not sitting here trying to necessarily target them. The interesting thing about Brandon Martinez is, first off, Martinez is a Sephardic name. Martinez lauds the greatness of the old Spanish dictator, whatever you want to call him, I, I don't care, leader, Franco. Franco is a Sephardic name. So not only is Martinez Sephardic, but the guy he engenders worship of, Franco, he's Sephardic too. Sarah Jessica Parker, she looks like an Ashkenazim. As does Jeff Goldblum, Barbara Streisand. Alan Arkin does not. Gene Wilder looks to me a little uh, not quite. Maybe he's mixed. Kirk Douglas, again, no. Michael Douglas, mm mm. Kate Hudson, absolutely not. Jennifer Connolly, no way. Lisa Kudrow. Now pay attention to some of these names, too. A lot of these names are going to be associated with, if you did an etymology search on names, these would be associated with oftentimes Irish, English, German, Spanish, French. Okay? All, all of that is is a, um, sorry, all that is is a geography. A geography maybe somebody was born in, or a culture that's not what their actual ethnicity is. Chris Cornell, not a shocker. And <sighs> he does have certain features that I find very distinct that I've seen in a number of other people that also go by the J way. Um, but I don't know that I would call him distinctly Ashkenazim. And then we could just keep going forever. And uh, I'm past an hour. What are you going to do? Live with it. There is one thing um, I want to bring up real quick, and I guess I'm going to have to wait till another time, I guess, huh? The idea of Tartaria. When you look at a lot of these old maps that folks show concerning Tartaria, and let me see if I can uh, just bring you up one uh, real quick, just to illustrate the point, and then I'm, then I'm out. What a lot of them are going to show you, and this is really important, they're going to show you uh, typically a vast area of Upper Asia. Let me see if I can pull this map up. Big size. Oh, okay, so that's quasi big size. So, a, a large area above what they say is China, India, and this lower Asia area. Okay, they're all that Grand Tartary. Tartary, Grand Tartary. Okay, that's basically the idea. Now, you'll see some maps where it'll have smaller sections of Northern Asia that is labeled as Tartary. Okay. So, here's something I want you to keep in mind. And I am going and finding um, the old Mercator North Pole map. So um, I apologize. It's the Mercator 15. New. Oh, come on. There it is. So sorry. Passed it over three times. Now, I want you to notice something between these two maps. So, not just these two. A lot of them, you're going to see this, this broad expanse sort of area. And sometimes you'll find these maps where, like, it just extends way over into the Middle East. Huge areas, right? Tartary, Grand Tartary, Lesser Tartary, 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 Tartar, Tartary. Something I want you to keep in mind. For one thing, yeah, the, this old Mercator North Pole map. Now, notice... If you go around the, the land that he has laid out all around this um, uh, 
contrivance in, in the center here, which no one knows is true or not true. Okay, we're talking about Mercator, who I wouldn't trust. But you look at these areas, and what you're going to see over and over and over and over is pars. Okay, he has, for instance, a Ameri ke pars. Ameri ke pars. He has other pars in what we would consider Asia. Okay, there's various areas, and when you go in and, and start looking at the text close up, you'll see other areas which he has this word pars because it was this Latin word used basically for parts. So they say. <laughs> did it mean pars or did it mean Paris? Anyways, we do know that in a number of uh, Latin languages that pars actually does mean um, areas. Now, what its etymology is, I don't know. Just bringing that to your attention. Now, the other thing is this. So, in Obri, and I can tell you that many of the older languages like Latin and Greek have a lot of Obri terms in them that have remained with us into our modern languages. Why that is, I don't know. No one can tell you one way or the other. I'm just, it's a fact. It's a feature. If we go to the term tar, we'll see it in two entries in Obri. It's H8388 and H8389. The first one is used frequently in, for instance, the book of Joshua. Four times and then once in the book of Isaiah. Let me just go to an English translation of these, okay? So you'll see it in Isaiah. Now, in, in Joshua, it's concerning areas of inheritance in the sense of the boundaries, um, drawing out all of these boundaries, boundary markers of different areas of the different tribes' inheritance. In Isaiah 44, 13, the way it's used is it says, The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. We're talking about denoting areas as design or uh, for something in particular, so on and so forth, okay? And then the other way that it's used, and now tar is found in other words too, but I'm just saying, the other way it's used is in 8389, sometimes as form, sometimes as beauty, sometimes as favor, goodly, comely, countenance, fair, resembled, visage. Unfreaking believable basically uh, bearing with it the idea of a silhouette, someone's form, to look at their, their outline, the area that they occupy, tar. When you do doubles, especially in Obri, and I showed this with Shosho in episode number seven of the Obri Hours, it's really just a double. We'll see that in a lot of common English words where you, you will double a simple root. And it is almost like a way of just drilling home what something is. You double that root. Okay. Go-go dancer. What does that mean? Go-go. Because -go. I mean, she moves all the time. It does happen a lot. So we've got tar and we've got tar. We know that essentially, geographically speaking, it just basically means an, an outline, a container, a silhouette, something, an area. It's nondescript. And its root is most likely R. The T at the beginning is used all the time in various different Obri words. R. Um, R having oftentimes to do with lights, rays, or actually just emanating from R. Okay? It's also used like in ER, which is um, a term for a particular sort of river, which I think might be delta. Definitely having something to do with sort of a spreading going forth and emanating. Maybe if there's better words than that, you can think of them. Now what's interesting uh, on top of that is if we just go to the online etymology dictionary, which is not going to give us nearly enough information that we need, but we can look at tar. Just the word tar, T-A-R, as it's understood in English, and basically edit. the etymology you're going to see for most of these is like European or Proto-Indo-European. 
Tar, late old English, meaning to smear with tar from tar to tar. From the verb to tar, meaning what? To spread, smear out. It's this idea of a spreading out, an area, tar. And we can see this in a few other things. We can see it in tear. Let me find terra. Oh, I might have typed in the wrong thing. This is a prefix. Terra, um, again, Proto-Indo-European root, meaning to rub, turn, uh, very much uh, like to tar, but also meaning what? It's a pro again, Proto-Indo-European prefix, meaning what? To cross over, pass through, or overcome. Again, we're talking about space, area, And then if we look at, um, let me see if it's, O is actually, that's, uh, that's Gaelic. And it would be from, from Te'er, meaning a, a hill, mountain, or watershed. Te'er, tar. So let's try U. I think actually, for instance, oh yeah, one of the words I found was turban having to do with um, an area, a thing, a large thing creating a large mass, the tour. Um, these aren't absolute. The English ones aren't absolute. The, the English etymology ones, you really mostly can only rely on the ones that say they're Proto-Indo-European, sometimes Greek and sometimes Latin. The strongest ones of those were basically tar and terre, because they illustrate to you the point of tar. You put that all together, and then you consider this area that's called Tartaria or Tartari. And most likely, you're just looking at something that was referred to as a great expanse, which for all we know, covered maybe not completely, maybe it was broken by wetlands, various waterways, so on and so forth, because nobody knows, because we're not allowed to go there and see the area of what they call the North Pole. Nobody knows if there's a great sea there. Nobody knows if there's a great ice cap there. Nobody knows if there isn't just a lot of broken land between Canada and Upper Asia. Nobody knows we can't go there we don't have anything objective no objective sources to tell us whether it, there isn't just solid continuous land from canada to asia perhaps broken by various things maybe again when you start getting into canada canada has so many lakes there's so many uh breaks in the land it looks so stinking porous you know up in canada now, I'd, i don't know if upper asia is supposed to look the same way that's my point. Literally, it could have just been traditionally referred to as this large expanse from the uppermost portions where peoples in North America lived further. Anytime you're talking about North, we're not ending at the North Pole either. you got to remember that. Anytime, for instance, the Bible refers to North, it's simply pointing in that direction and can continue past that. And you can keep going. If it says that a certain people would come from the north, you simply have to point in that direction, figure yourself for looking at a Gleason's style as a Muthal equidistance map, and then just point in that direction, just keep going. That's how you can understand these directions in the Bible. So I just wanted to bring that up concerning this idea of calling so many things Tartarian and what the word Tartary, Tartaria, most likely even means and why we shouldn't why we should be hesitant to just apply these labels so with that i'm out take care